Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. service here from the Lake Tarpon Church of Christ. We'll begin our study this evening in Acts chapter 16, verse 11. Acts chapter 16, verse 11. But let's start with the word of prayer. God, thank you for this time you allowed us to be together. Thank you for our hymn, the song that we heard before we came in to have our Bible study. We're so grateful for it, Father God. And yes, honor and strength be to you forever and ever. For there's no one greater than you. There's no one better than you. And no matter how much we think about ourselves in a prideful, arrogant way, people in general, you are the one and only true living God and you have say so over, over all the earth. Father, forgive us of any sin that may be within our lives, knowingly or unknowingly, whether thought, word, or deed. May your grace and mercy be with us during this time of study. May your will be done, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. So grateful for all the opportunities you give us to make a living, to provide for our families, to give offerings to the church, that your kingdom may be glorified here on earth as it is in heaven. Bless all those who are hurting, all those who are going through spiritual battles, all those who are sick and afflicted, all those who are homeless and incarcerated. Be with all those who are struggling with their faith. And Father God, we pray that your will be done. Lord, be with the leaders of our nation. Help them, Father God, to have a heart knitted to you, transformed by the power of your word and of who you are, and be with the leaders of our congregation that they may have the wisdom to do what needs to be done, that your will may be done within this church, that it may be glorified within our community, heard about within the state, and pleasing in your sight. Father, we pray that as you help us to study your word, give us spiritual understanding exactly what your word means, help us to apply it with all eagerness, and help us to live it out that others may see and desire what we have, and that's a relationship with you. Father, it's all about you, more of you and less of us, all of you and none of us. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. We're in Acts chapter 16, verse 11. If you remember now, Timothy's on a journey with Paul and Silas, and they're going to do none other than spread the gospel all throughout the regions. The book of Acts is very important because this is where the church started, and Paul would visit these, um, the church in Ephesus, the church in Thessalonica, um, these different churches in Asia Minor, and he'll, bu he'll build the church, he'll start a church there. And so that's how we have 
the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, we're going to see here, the book of Thessalonians. It's all because of these journeys, but it had its start in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is very important for Christians to study from, and that's what we're going to do. Verse 11 says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Sethanus, or Sethotros, and the next day came to Neopolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city, that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. So he's going to start a church in Philippi, which we get the book of Ephesians from, and he's going to start this congregation, but notice that they're sailing in rough weather, in terrain. They're not in a yacht. They're not in a, a boat where they can just go to the bottom of it, even though they had a bottom, but it didn't have luxury. It didn't have a bathroom on there. It didn't have a small kitchen on there. They didn't have cars. They didn't have vehicles. They are going through some rough terrain for all for the gospel of Jesus Christ, traveling in all kind of weather, good, bad, and, and so on. In verse 13, and on a Sabbath day, Saturday, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Notice the heart of the individuals in the city where he's at, the colony of Macedonia. And it says on a, on a Saturday, we went to the city by the riverside where prayer was customarily made, meaning it was done all the time in this place. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So women were meeting here. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened our heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. She was a worshiper of God in the way that she knows to worship God. But when you see a seller of purple, this woman had money. She had a lot of money because of what she was selling. But God opened our heart. Notice what it says. The Lord opened our heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. But remember, it said, she who worshiped God. So she had a form of worship to God. But Paul is going to help her to get an understanding because she's ready. How do we know people are ready to hear the gospel? Because God has to open their heart. If you share your faith and they're not receiving it or doing what you ask them to do according to the word, God hasn't opened their heart yet. God has to open their heart. When God opens their heart, there's no rebellion against it. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Notice the book of Acts is written by, by Luke, as well as the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. So he's originally writing to his um, his. Uh, not a slave owner, but the person, um, he's writing to a gentleman at the time to help him understand the gospel. But he's including himself in this. He's saying us, because now he's on a journey. He's not saying they, he's saying us. And then now it happened. As we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who was brought here or brought her master's much profit for fortune telling. We have fortune telling going on today. We have sorcery going on today, witchcraft, palm reading. This is the example of that. It was going on in the first century and it's going on today. But notice that this is a lucrative business. It made her master's money then and it's still making people money today. Fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us, meaning Luke as well, and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Notice what God's spirit is convincing her spirit to talk about. She has a spirit of witchcraft, spirit of fortune telling. Um, this is all wicked stuff. But when she sees the presence of these men, she knows that they're speaking on behalf of God. Proclaim or tell us about the way of salvation. In Luke chapter 16 verse 18 and this she said for many days but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and he came out that very hour but when her master saw that her hope of the prophet was gone they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities 
Notice this, people do that today. They think they can speak to a person that we know is living a wicked life and tell the spirit to come out of that person. They can't do it. It only can be done by the apostles and the last apostle is dead now, so it can't be done, but God could change the heart of the person. So now here, notice that people are worried about money. They great annoy or greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, Paul saying, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. She's making a lot of noise. She's going around saying, these are the servants of the most high God. These are the servants of the, I mean, if she's going on for days saying this loud, people are going to get annoyed. Well, he got annoyed. And look why the masters were mad. They weren't mad that she gave her life to Christ or that she was turning to follow God because that spirit came out of her. They were mad because their money's gone. <laughs> when her master saw that their hope of a prophet was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. But how do they trouble the city? They didn't trouble the city. They troubled the people who were doing wicked stuff and now they're turning toward God. So the trouble came because the city wasn't seeing a prophet. And teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. So here it is. The problem with the church today is that we allow other people to dictate what's right and what's wrong. Paul wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't there for a prophet. He was there to speak the word. But he wasn't speaking to the lady. Even though the lady heard it, she knew exactly who they were. Now they want to persecute the innocent because the money that they're making, the evil ways that they're making money is God. Then the multitude rose up together against them, against Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. They're being beaten with rods. Notice how powerful the gospel is. Powerful enough to someone who's doing good to be acting as if they're doing wrong and now they're gonna be beaten. Not with a belt, but with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into stocks. Notice what's going on. These men are doing, they're, they're sharing the gospel. The woman realizes who they are, and now the people of the city realize that the prophet is going in this. So what do they do? Bring them to the magistrates, the people who uphold the law in that city. And they found, and then they tore their, their shirt or their robe, meaning anger. That was a sign of anger and judgments getting ready to come. Not only that, they beat them. After they beat them, they threw them in a prison and they fastened their feet in the stocks. So it's not like prison today where you can go all around a prison, go to wreck and go work out and go eat. No, they're stuck. They're in stocks. They can't go anywhere. After being beaten, after being thrown in prison, now they're placed in these stocks, hurting, bleeding. But watch the attitude of these people who are serving God. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and what? Singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. You see this? Praying and singing hymns to God. After they're being beaten, after they're thrown in a prison, after they're being put in stocks. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. So they're singing and praising God. When praises go up, blessings come down. Now, if we think that we can sing and praise God today, we can do that, but in prison you think the gates are gonna open, we're gonna walk out, we have another thing coming. They didn't have what we have now. See, we have God's word. Here they had to see God at work to come to believe in God. And so now they're singing praises to God and now the chains are being broken off. They could have escaped. They could have left. But they stayed because they did nothing wrong. 
So when someone escapes, if a Roman prison guard allows someone to escape, that's his life. And the Roman crucifixion was so bad that they'd rather kill themselves than have the Romans kill them because they were tortured, then they were killed. So what did he do he immediately? He didn't say, wait, I'm gonna go home and see my family, my kids, they wanna kill myself. Immediately, he wanted to take his own life. Paul calls out with a loud voice saying, do not do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Look at the power of, the, of God, the power of the gospel. Here he is, supposed to be keeping guard for them, but what does he end up doing after seeing the glory of God? Bowing down before them. You see, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Either you bow now, willfully, or you'll bow later, and you'll be forced to bow, and there'll be no hope for you. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The power of God. The power of the gospel. What he's really saying is, what must I do to have a change of life? What must I do to believe how you believe, to walk how you're walking, to have that change, that power? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. There's where we stop for a moment, because there's people that say, all you got to do is believe in Jesus, and you'll be saved. No, there's more to it. That's the beginning of it. But people stop short there thinking they have salvation. That's not the case. They didn't go all the way. Believing is going to get you to be baptized. Notice what, what Lydia did. Her whole household were baptized. So it doesn't stop there. That's just the beginning of it. And look what it says. It says, So they said to him, or they said, Believe on the Lord, not believe in them, there's preachers that want people to believe in them. Pastors that, that want people to worship them. Believe on the Lord. The Lord means master. Jesus means Jehovah saves. Christ is the anointed one. And you will be saved, you and your household. See, they know if God can change the person, the whole household is going to follow the, the dad or follow the leader. See, men are supposed to be leaders in the house. And people, the house is supposed to follow their leadership. But now men are relinquishing what God has called them to do. And no one's being saved. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. What did they speak? The Bible. But what did they have then? Scrolls. They spoke what we're speaking today, God's word. And he took them, excuse me, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Look at the change of heart. First, he's told to keep guard of these men. If anything happens to them, it's your life. He's keeping guard. The, the spirit comes down and breaks the shackles off. See, God is breaking shackles today. There's many people incarcerated. You don't got to be in a physical jail. People incarcerated by alcohol and drugs and being with multiple women and lying and stealing and all. This is the, the, the Satan is, is at work in their life. They are spiritually separated from God. They were, they were incarcerated, incarcerated spiritually. But God is trying to break the shackles, break off what's binding them, loose what Satan has a hold of them. So Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil, right? The devil made us do nothing. He enticed us and then we end up doing it, but we incarcerate ourselves. And God through his word is trying to free us of that bondage. Here in the physical sense, they were broken off. Now the man says, what must I do to be saved? They say, believe on the Lord. Our message for everyone is to believe on Christ. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. So he cleaned up their bandages, cleaned up their wounds, and bandaged them. So look at the turn of events here. And then him and his household were saved. Let's keep going. Baptized. Now, verse 34, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. He rejoiced of the power that God changed his life. See, the book of Acts and the book of Luke was writing to, now his name came back up to me, in my mind, was Theopolis. And 
um, history tells us that this man was would put Luke through school and help him get a better life because history tells us that Luke's parents were slaves of Theopolis. But they wanted to be that way, meaning that he took care of them. There's some slaves that were taken care of and they didn't want to go free in the year of Jubilee. Well, their parents died, his parents died, and the man put Luke through school. So he's writing to him now that he got the gospel saying, listen, let me tell you about Jesus. And so the message is to him, but it's for us because the book of Acts tells us how the church started. Let me keep going, just a couple more verses for this evening. So then he brought him to his house and he rejoiced. Verse 35, and it was they the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. Now leave. Okay, we understand you did nothing wrong, now go, but watch what they do. But Paul said to them, they had beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they put us out secretly? They don't want to make no noise about it? Watch this. No, indeed, let them come themselves to get us out. No, the magistrates, you come and let us out. Don't let us out secretly because you know you were wrong. Second person being thrown in prison like this man I heard for 45 years. And he didn't even commit the crime. 45 years. And it's like this saying, well, we know you're now you're innocent. Just leave in the middle of the night and act like this never happened. Yeah. No, you can't do that. It happened openly. His name was diminished. He did nothing wrong. He lost 45 years of freedom for his life outside of prison. Now you want to just let him go? Paul saying, no. Let them come down and let us out. Verse 38. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. See, what they did, they can't do to Roman citizens. They'll get in trouble. Then they came and pleaded with them. Pleaded means begged. And brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. Please just leave. Please just go. Please, let us go back to how we were living before you came here. Please just, you know, verse 40. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Notice the heart of these individuals. We start in chapter 17, next time, Lord willing. They rejoiced. They still have the scars on them from being beaten. They probably still have the marks on their ankles for being in stocks. But they rejoice because look, who received the message? The, the, the prison guard and his family, so God's will was done. Even in our misery and in our pain, if you could muster up enough strength, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and continue to spread the good news. There's a rejoicing in that and there's an encouragement for others because yeah, I'm in the battle. I'm in the battle, you're in the battle, we're in the battle, but can we still do God's will while we're in this battle? Because the Lord fights for us. We pray that you are blessed by this message and we begin in Acts chapter 17, Lord willing, a week from today, which is next Wednesday. Be blessed in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.